systems, modeling, applications, they everything. And so, and uh, as usual, the very important thing that Telosoc is socializing. This is why by will we have a three hour lunch break. Uh, just to discuss stuff. And so this is really the most important thing. And a couple of projects have been opa, opa. invented here. They began here because we had sat together and had discussed. Uh, tonight we will have a Uso reception. Those have been here a couple of times. It will not take place at this very nice uh, <coughs> balcony at the Cafe Neo. But we managed to get the um, fish bar, the beach bar, from 7 o'clock on. So they reserved it for us and we will have the Uso reception at the beach bar at 7 o'clock. And then, let's say, after one hour we go up to the main restaurant and then yeah. So tomorrow, so and then on Wednesday we have the excursion. We are going to Spina Longa. We have been here, I think, twice already. At Spina Longa, also have been here a couple of times already. Spina Longa is a very, very nice island. It's a bus trip that takes us about 90 minutes to a very nice village called Elunda. From Elunda we take a boat. It's a 15-minute boat trip to this island, and it's a lepra colony. We will have a, a guided tour. It's a very nice lady. She is a, a professor of history. She was a professor of history. She will guide us. We we'll have a new lady. Huh? We we'll have a new lady this year. Ah, new lady. New lady. <laughs> even even nicer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will know again. She's okay. She has <laughs> <okay. She laughs> <okay. laughs> <laughs> 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 yeah. And uh, the, the, the big surprise. <laughs> Uh, because we had the uh, late cancellation of two speakers and uh, Femis and Johanna were discussing and they organized on sun, the Saturday afternoon a visit to Windows. We will have Greek finger food and with each little finger food we will have a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> so the day will be done after that. So said those of you who are still there uh, we will leave Temis at, at, at 2 o'clock, 1.30 on Saturday. We will leave from here at 1 o'clock. And we will be there to, to past. Uh, okay, back. so we will leave at 1 o'clock. At 1 o'clock. Uh, Saturday at 1 o'clock. And the Luna? Spina Loka? 1 o'clock. Uh, also at 1 o'clock. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. So, you will enjoy it. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, today, the first day is quantum computing. I have a very crazy. Very crazy talk, and I won't be upset if many of you will leave because it's really <coughs> packed with mathematics. Yeah? So, uh, uh, I double checked with a few people, I take a look around, and they said, Yes, Frank, it's okay to come up with this crazy subject. Uh, it will be about entanglement, black holes, and warm holes, and the main reason is I always want to understand what entanglement is, and I bumped into a couple of papers that have to do with astrophysics, right? It's already laughing. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So it will be cross domain. And then in the afternoon it will be Vedran, Vedran Tutsko from Leiden University. He will, it's theoretical stuff, right? Okay, absolutely. And uh, whenever he publishes a paper, I read it and then pass it on to my colleagues at the university, they must read it too. Right? And then afterwards we have Stefan, Stefan Bernhardt, many of you know him from last time. He will talk about applications, scale and quantum computing, Stefan. Stefan. Stefan, yeah. So this is application. Also when he publishes paper, we will it also. So we are interested in the theoretical stuff as well as in the educational stuff. So I'm very proud and grateful that both speakers are here again. Yeah? Okay. So now let's start with uh, so I meant it absolute serious. If you get bored, because there's a lot of mathematics behind it, right? Leave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Black holes, warm holes, and entanglement. Um, I will remind you what entanglement is, and after that I'm going to present Einstein's fields equation. Right? That will be most of the mathematics. What the hell is this? I'm going to influence all the differential geometry behind it. Then I cover black holes. I will discuss properties of black holes. Then come to uh, warm holes. In, in the course of this one, I will introduce something that is famous since two or three years, an equation called ER equals EPR, and then I close up with the two friends that are still in 
Examples. If you begin to work with quantum computing, you see the different belt states. Here's another state that is famous. Here's the uh, GLC. So these are a bunch of bunch of states. I will discuss more how many states there are on the on the, on the, on the, on the quantum computer. And there's a the real power of entanglement is if you take a look at this state here. If I measure the first qubit. Right? I measure a zero, and the second qubit still remains in the state zero or one in superposition. That means you don't lose any freedom. The second qubit doesn't lose any freedom. If you have, uh, because it is separable, right? You can write it this way. Another uh, state is this state here. This state is entangled because when I measure the first qubit and it happened to be zero, the second qubit is immediately fixed. If I measure the first qubit, it turns out to be a one. The second qubit is immediately fixed. The mean, in entangled states, if I manipulate or measure one qubit, the others lose their freedom. Right? They are <coughs> they are strongly correlated. Right? And uh, this is very interesting because the, the the entanglement happens along arbitrary huge distances. As soon as I measure one qubit, the status of the other is immediately fixed and determined by the measurement of the first qubit. And this is, as I said before, independent of the physical distance of the measurement. And that means there can't be any communication, no interaction can take place between the qubits because of the speed of light, which is limited, blah, 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 blah. So what is happening here? This is extremely strange. A lot of philosophy happened, some explanations happened, and we will dive at, uh, in, in the last uh, 30 minutes, uh, once I prepared you with blackouts and wormholes, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> and if something happens, and it's, it's uh, without any communication, this is called non-local, right? Because the two piece, pieces can't communicate, it's non-local, it's a non-local phenomenon, and the physics, once entanglement, by the way, entanglement has been described first by Einstein and his colleagues. I will come back to that. The physics before was local. Everything was local. Here we have a non-local phenomenon. And this is then called the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. He introduced, he was the first to introduce entanglement and pointed out this can't be. Quantum physics must be wrong. Yeah, well, this was his, his claim. And they called this spooky actions at a distance. He was yeah. laughing about the physicists to say this is something new as it does, this is spooky action in country. Right? So, and the intuition behind this, you have these two qubits, these two particles, here the two dices, right? Um, I have the black dice, you have the red dice, and you fly to Mars or somewhere else, right, to a long distance, and then you give me a call and say I'm there, then I roll my dice, Right? And as soon as I know what the dice basically show, you have the same result. <coughs> it's far away. And this basically means Einstein said there must be some hidden variables. Quantum physics, what this claim is not complete. There have to be some hidden variables that we don't understand yet. In the process of entanglement, these hidden variables are set. And if you tear them apart in the long distance, the values are there, right? And uh, if I do an experiment here, then the hidden values have been set. The other dice knows what to show, which surface to show, right? Hidden variables, and this, uh, this is independent of measurement because they are set up front, right? It's independent of uh, measurement, and this is realism, right? Einstein was talking in famous meetings with Heisenberg and so on and said, do you believe that the moon is there even if you don't take a look at it? And then the quantum says, uh, well, it's an, it's an experiment, it's a random experiment, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. right? But I'm just that you are basically moving the same. 
this is realism, right? Very realistic. <coughs> the, the content of the slide is uh, irrelevant. Uh, because, <laughs> no, but, because I'm not going to explain all the stuff here. But then people were thinking about, well, if quantum physics is uh, non-local and not realistic, how can we prove it? And then some 30 years later, nearly 30 years later, after an EPR paper, Bell came up with an inequality uh, saying, okay, if I have uh, the local and realistic theory, like physics before quantum physics, right? A certain inequality, <coughs> inequality has to be satisfied. And all the classical experiments did it. And once the mathematics has been set to prove that a quantum physics is as quantum physics is, right? Um, people started experiments. Right? This gentleman started 10 years later, Clauser, and he had some mistakes. Then Aspen, Nobel Prize winner, did other experiments. He came really close. And Anton Zeilinger, if you perform from the University of Vienna, he basically performed experiments that basically proved that the Bell inequality is not satisfied in quantum physics. Since then we know there is something really new, new going on. It is a non-local, non-realistic theory. Right? So this is the final proof. And it was awarded last year by the Nobel Prize. And entanglement is a uh, global problem. Here I, I have a quantum register. I discussed a couple of times in earlier years, right? Qubits can be represented in polar coordinates on the two-dimensional sphere, right? So it's a qubit, and if you bundle qubits together in a register, yeah, you have here a, a, a quantum register. And if I fiddle around with one qubit, then the others are undisturbed, right? Like I have a register in classical sense, I change one bit in the register, the other bits are not influenced at all. But if they are entangled, and then I feel wrong with one qubit, the others are also <laughs> yeah, the others are also affected too. Right? And this kind of entanglement, this entanglement, not this entanglement is absolutely unique for quantum computing. <coughs> right? And it means um, each computation that is not involving entanglement can in theory, in principle, be performed also on the classical computer. Where in principle is a bit strange because if you have n qubits, you have 2 to the power of n, you need 2 to the power of n classical storage in order to represent the quantum register. If n is 300, you need to turn each and every atom of the universe into a bit in order to represent this kind of state. And 300 is nothing. I gave is 433 qubits, they are further growing. Right? I think Stefan took that atom after this afternoon to explain what the plans are, or what the intent is, how to grow it. Um, so in theory you could do it, but in practice you can't. Right? I, I know that in Munich they built a GPU cluster of 6,500. I always need to look to the but the number is correct. And they can simulate 46 qubits. And then you need 6,500 GPUs in concert. Uh, and beyond that you will basically make. And then there's a very famous theorem by Joshua and Linden. Every quantum algorithm shown in exponential speed up compared to classical algorithm must exploit entanglement. But if an algorithm does not exploit entanglement, you can never achieve the exponential speed up. You can achieve the speed up. Like a robot doesn't use entanglement, but you have at least polynomial speed up. Right? Then it's not only speed up in the literature, you always read the power of quantum, the speed up, you can make algorithms much faster. But the speed up is highlighted as a quantum advantage, but what we realize is, what others realize too, uh, precision can also be enhanced, for example, in classification. So we run experiments where we then uh, uh, try to classify data, I'm not discussing what the data basically are. Classical algorithms, we achieve this kind of, of, uh, of accuracy. With a quantum algorithm, we achieve 90%. We, achieve we try a vast of different kind of classical algorithm, and we never came close to the 90% of accuracy. So precision is key. Think about uh, having a higher precision when you uh, have a ETFs. You have a portfolio and you need to reshuffle it once a day, right? Uh, if you achieve, if you're a big bank that are shuffling around billions of, of dollars, right? If you have precision, a better precision in the third day, <coughs> right? Then you gain a, gain a lot of money and more. Um, it's well known that the more test data you use, 
the smaller is the average error in classical supervised learning. Right? But if it comes to entanglement, right, you can basically prove that the error you do is this formula, where R is the so-called Schmidt, Schmidt rate, it's a measurement of the degree of entanglement of data, M is the cardinality of the, the number of training data, and D is the direction of the tuple of data that you basically have. And what that basically means is, if you have highly entangled data, a single training data couple suffice in order to learn something precisely. Like this was uh, unbelievable, but Alexander, you have a poster for that on this subject? Yeah, okay. okay. So we, take a, we took a look at, 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 uh, at, uh, at this uh, paper. We found potentials to weaken the assumptions and have a much better result here. And we tested it experimentally. The main authors group three years ago, they also claimed that they verified it by experiments. We want to get the test data, but we didn't get it because this was, was alarmist, right? And it was data from military. And they, of course, did check. So then we basically uh, had a little team, Alexander led this team, and we did measurements, and we proved both by experiments that this is true. So this is another effect of entanglement, right? The more entangled data you have, the faster you can learn uh, neural nets and so on. Yeah, so a single maximum entangled element of training data suffice in high dimension to learn with low risk of unitary transformation. So entanglement is important. And I showed you a few states of entanglement. Because entanglement is so important. How many entangled states and how difficult is it to get an entangled state? There are a couple of papers are there. And one that I find impressive is if S is the collection of separable state and D is the set of all state, then this fraction is exponentially small in N. That means entanglement is ubiquitous. Right? It's the exception to run into a separable state, the vast majority of states is entangled. So the power of entanglement is really, is really there. You can really use it. <coughs> so, this was the fun part, the easy part. <laughs> I, I already warned you. Now we come to Einstein's field equation. This is nothing else than a theorem of Pythagoras. What it basically means you have two points and you measure the distance of the points, then you have this equation, Pythagoras, right? And this is, I abbreviate it here with delta, the difference between the uh, first, second, third coordinates. And this is then written mathematically. This is called the line element, right? You measure the distance of two infinitesimal close points by this kind of a formula. This is Pythagoras. It looks differently, but it's nothing else than Pythagoras. And um, if you use different coordinates, so in this slide, I basically used um, uh, uh, the standard basis here in free space, right? It's an orthonormal basis. If I use a, di a different basis here drawn in R2, and you measure the length of a vector, as you multiply the vector with itself, blah, 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 you compute, you compute, you compute, then you get this kind of a formula here. And this G, I, J, they are basically the the uh, scalar product of the different kind of combinations of the um, uh, coordinates. And this gives right that the line element in different coordinates must be rewritten. There are new coefficients to this, to the differences in the, in the different coordinates. And this matrix that consists out of the GIJ is called the first fundamental form. GIJ, first fundamental form. So, and if you are in arbitrary high space, then it looks like this, here, right? It's the sum of uh, G, I, J, D, I, T, X, I, D, X, J. Uh, uh, as you see some people writing, I'm sharing the slides, of course, right? So anybody, we talk, uh, what happens is, if you don't object as a speaker, we take a video, it will be published on YouTube. So if you are a speaker and you don't want to be published on YouTube, let, let me or Dennis know, then we switch it off. And typically, we also ask you to share the slides. We publish it on the Samosov website so that you can, if anyone is interested, download the slides. Right? So, and then, uh, in an arbitrary space, let, uh, this is a surfed, uh, curved surface. Some people, some mathematicians, call it uh, a manifold. Right? 
And if you have the tangent vectors on, on, on the, at, at a given point, it's called then the tangent space at this, at this point. And the fundamental form that allows you to measure something is a matrix and it depends on the point x. Right? The fundamental form, the way how you measure something, lengths and surfaces and so on, it's, it's a function of point x. Right? What that basically means, this gx, right, the fundamental form, defines a scalar product on the tangent space. And if you have a scalar product on the tangent space, you can take the vectors v and w, you transpose v, uh, you leave w intact, multiply to the matrix, and then you get the scalar product. If you have the scalar product, then you can, it, it uses a metric on the vector space. You can compute lengths and angles and distances and so on. And this is why the matrix GX, first called fundamental form, is from now on called a metric, the, the Riemannian metric on this type of curve of the surface. Right? The Riemannian metric, and the manifold with the Riemannian metric is called the Riemannian manifold. Yeah. And this uh, <coughs> metric can be used to compute length. So if you have a manifold here, a curved surface, you have a curve on the curved surface, uh, you can compute the length by taking the integral from the starting point T1 to T2, and here is the, is the metric that is changing from point to point, and so you compute lengths of curves on a manifold. Yeah? Very simple. Next step further, it gets a bit more complicated, is a directional <coughs> derivative. I assume that everybody knows from kindergarten what the partial derivative is. <laughs> now we discuss what is directional derivative. Right? The directional derivative is you take a, a, the function f, you take the point x, you, ex you extend x in the direction of v a little bit, minus f on x, then you have the distance between the two points, you divide it by h, then you take the limit h against zero, then you get the the order of change in the direction v. Right? This is the direction of derivative. Different kind of writings, capital D, this, this kind of D, this uh, atlet it's called, or that df derived uh, over dv. And then you learn in, in, in mathematics, not in kindergarten, that the derivative of a function is the gradient of the function times the vector f, the direction in which you want to see how it's changed. And, uh, if you extend it, uh, f was a function, uh, a function here, you have a real map, capital F is a real map, right? Then you take, uh, if this is a real map, you take the component <coughs> of the map, and then you take the derivative in the component, and this is something that's called the Jacobi matrix, some people have heard about. Yeah? So, and so I introduced the, direct, uh, the directional derivative in order to introduce Parallel transport, and parallel transport is used to measure curvature of a manifold. So this is what happens now. So if you have a map that assigns with each point on this, on this surface a, t a tangent vector at the same point, then you call this a vector field. Right? It's a vector field. And if here I have a curve, I have a vector field x here, and what we define now is I have this vector x and I want to transport it parallel along the, the curve gamma. Right? And we say that x is parallel along gamma if the vector field x taken at a point at the curve and then I take the directional derivative in the direction of the tangent vector. Right? So here is x, this is the tangent vector and I measure how, how much x is changing with the, tangent, with the tangent vector. In fact, I measure, so to speak, the angle between x at each point and uh, the uh, tangent vector. And we call it the parallel if the, if the vector field x doesn't change in the direction of the tangent of the curve. And then it's a theorem about differential equation. You use a very long theorem about differential equation. But if you take an arbitrary vector v0, then you find exactly one vector field, capital V, so that, so that v is parallel along gamma, and v starts at this point in this direction v0. But if you really think about it, it's 
uniqueness of uh, solutions of different equations. Right, so parallel transport. And the parallel transport is when here I start in the, at the tangent space at gamma zero, let's assume here's gamma zero, and then I take a look where the vector ends at uh, uh, gamma t1, right, and then I take this vector field and observe how this uh, vector is basically transported. Only the imagination is important, not the formulas, right? Only the imagination. So the next thing is symbolic. You don't need to understand here. I'm introducing only some symbols because the symbols will appear a couple of times. So if I have uh, vector fields x1 to xm that happen to be a basis of the tangent spatial TPM, and I want to uh, compute the directional derivative of gamma uh, of, of xj in the direction of xi. Then you introduce this kind of coefficients, gamma, k, a, j, uh, i, j, which are called the so-called Christopher symbols. It's only the coefficients in the new, in the matrix. So nothing weird is happening here. And, and this, you can compute the Christopher symbols, and what you see here is the uh, Riemannian metric. It's the metric Christopher symbols can be expressed in the metric or partial derivatives of the metric, right? So, the, and again, that means, oh, sorry, that basically means that the Christopher, that, so that the partial derivatives, the, the direct derivatives on a closed surface are determined by the uh, Riemann, Riemannian metric. Very surprising, think about it, not if you're going to get the first time. And, and the Christopher symbols can also be used if you have a vector field x and the vector field y, expressed in the spaces vector fields, right? Then you can compute the direction, the directional derivative of y in the direction of x. Here you get the coefficients <coughs> k, and they can also be expressed by means of the Christopher symbols. That means uh, any kind of direction derivative on a, on a curved surface is controlled by the metrics because the Christopher uh, symbols have been uh, determined by the, by the uh, remaining metric. So this remainder metric, the metric how you measure distances in tangent space seems to be fundamental. The next phenomenon is holonomy. So what I'm doing here is I, uh, I'm doing is I start in a point A and take a vector V and have a curve from A to B and I transport V parallel along the curve and I arrive here at B and this vector arrives. Then I take a, a, another curve from B to C. I transport this vector parallel along the curve BC, and then I take the resulting vector, transport it from C to A, it's a closed loop here, and then I recognize that the vector W that I get by moving it around here is different from V, there's an angle between it. This phenomenon is called holonomy. Yeah, so this is not the text, oh, this is not the text, ah, this is not the text here, blah, 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 it's not the original magnet, this is holonomy. And holonomy is used to define what curvature of a curved surface on the manifold of the manifold is. <coughs> what I have here is I have three vector fields x, y, z. Uh, I have uh, curves delta and gamma that are determined by x. So uh, these are called such these solutions of the equation that are determined by x. I start with the vector z. I move it from the point. Uh, delta is 0 to delta is 1 and transport in parallel. I take the second path here in reverse direction. I use uh, the blue curve again, the green curve. And then, of course, I see also um, that the vectors are different. It's holonomy. Holonomy now is, is, a, is a measure of uh, curvature. And if I make S0, uh, uh, close to S1 and uh, T0 close to T1, I take the infinite. Uh, I take this kind of surface infinitesimally small, and then I get uh, a measurement R X Y of Z. This is this expressions of the confused expression. The uh, expression is not really important, and and this is a measure of the curvature. This is the Riemann curvature tensor, right? And this is now fundamental because. There is no assumption being made that this manifold is embedded in some real space. Right? That you have the manifold, I don't make any assumptions whether the surface is in an Rn or something. We call this um, the inner geometry. It means a manifold is an inner geometry independent 
whether or not it is in some <coughs> embracing space. Right? This is absolutely fundamental. By the way, the whole Riemannian geometry has been invented by, by the, the, the whole direction has been laid out by Riemann in his habilitation speech. Right? Uh, Riemann uh, got his habilitation by Karl Friedrich Gauss and he submitted three subjects as usual. Subjects, the first two subjects have been on number theory and Riemann said, okay, I have crazy subject right, on the nature of geometry. He will choose the uh, arithmetic subjects and Gauss it was a piece. He was saying, okay, take this geometry stuff. And he had three weeks time to lay out something where mathematicians are still working on. He laid out what is curvature, what are manifolds, and so on, in a few weeks. He was a genius. But, um, another formula. So this Riemann curvature takes three vector fields and um, uh, transports it in, in, in a new vector field. So at each point, it introduces a linear map, a multilinear map. The formulas are really not really important. What is important is you have this kind of linear map here, this capital phi, then you take the trace, and this is then called the reaching map. And also the reaching map introduces a curvature if you take a vector of the length one and you apply this trace here you have to get out a certain scalar and this is again only depending on the Christopher symbols and the Christopher symbols are determined by the Riemannian metric and the partial derivatives. That means the Riemannian metric, the way how you measure locally stuff, determines how the whole surface is basically curved. Right? And then you have geodesics, shortest lines. The text is for the time being not really relevant. You have here, here's, here's the sphere. I have P, uh, I have P and, and uh, Q. And if you have the um, uh, great circle here, the great circle is, the, is locally the shortest uh, path from Q to P. It's not globally because if I take the path from P, P the back of the sphere, back to Q, then the, uh, the path is much longer. So locally, geodesics are smallest uh, connections between two points. And then there is a differential equation that you can solve in order to determine what the geodesics are. Full stop. And again, what you see here is Christopher symbols, that means uh, the Riemannian metric. So the Riemannian metric also determines what are the shortest paths between two points on this kind of a manifold. Now we have all the material together to understand the very high level Einstein's field equation. What you see here is, is this Ricci tensor that I introduced that depends on, on the Christopher symbol on the, on, the, on, the, on the metric. Here's the metric itself and the Ricci scalar curvature. And here's something that physicists call the stress energy tensor. <coughs> right? So uh, here, here's the term in the Einstein field equation that measures, measures curvature. Here is a term that determines what uh, geodesics are, and here is matter. Right? And what you see here is what, what, what physicists say, matter tells the space how to curve, and the curve tells the matter how to move, because the matter is moving always along shortest paths, geodesics. Right? And this is here. So matter results in curvature of space-time, and particles are moving on geodesics. These are 16 partial differential equations of second order, right? It's a finger exercise to solve it, right? And the first solution was by uh, Karl Schwarzschild. Uh, he assumed I have, a, I have a mass M, and outside of the mass there's nothing else, right? And it, the mass does not rotate, it, it's not charged, right? That means if outside of the mass there is no matter, then this uh, tensor is zero. And then he came up with this kind of a solution, what the line element is, how to measure lengths, what the remaining metric is. Because these factors here are the coefficients of, this, of the remaining metric. And if you take a look at this thing, R should not be zero, because then you have a similarity in the equation. Right? And R shouldn't be 2gm divided by c squared, because then this term gets zero, and the division by zero is not allowed. It means this, this metric has two singularities. Right? And this, by the way, this thing here is called the Schwarzschild radius. Right? And what you can do is, if you choose proper coordinates, this does not become a singularity 
no longer. That means this is then rewritten if you choose different coordinate. But the singularity at zero still remains. Right? There's a proper singularity that cannot be removed by choosing different coordinate system. So at the center of the mass, there is a singularity. Something very strange must happen there. We'll see what, what, what is the strange thing there. Uh, if M is rotating, we don't need it, but I just show it because it's so nice, right? Um, uh, then, what you, then you get a different solution of the equations, the so-called care solution. And if you now take a look, at the singularity at zero is substituted by a circle. It means the, 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 singularity, the, the Schwarzschild black hole, I now introduce the term black hole, everything is concentrated on a single point. If the mass is rotating, everything is concentrated on a circle, a one-dimensional circle. Right? And there are also other stuff here. Uh, you have a so-called ergosphere. The ergosphere is the area in which all matter that gets close to the black hole rotates in the same direction than the black hole. And this is the torus. Right? So the ergo, so a black hole that is rotating looks from the outside like a torus. Do you take questions? Huh? You take questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is okay, absolutely. So Thank you for the asking. The mass is uh, pointwise, right? Huh? The mass is pointwise. Yes. So the poles pointwise. So when you say it's rotating, yes. is it rotating around its own axis or around some center? Uh, around its rotation axis. And then what defines the radius of the singularity? You need to solve it. I, yes. But it is sort of the rate of rotation or something? Is what? The rate of rotation? The, the rate? It's just, you have a. The momentum? Yeah. And based on the momentum, you can Absolutely. 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 So, and then Einstein took a look at this uh, field equation, and after a couple of weeks, he was unsatisfied. He said, because if you take a look at the, at the solutions, um, the solutions basically said that the space is expanding <coughs> or contracting. And he was again completely unsatisfied because space should be stable. Right, it should be stable. Then we introduce something that is called the cosmological constant lambda. So this term is new. And if you introduce this, right, then his hope was to come up with a stable space. He called this later on, it was the most stupidest idea he ever had. But in the meantime, it turned out that it was a very clever idea. Right? So I was a very strange person. Um, because if you have if you assume lambda is greater than zero. Then you introduce something that some of you have heard as dark energy. Right? So cosmological constant bigger than zero, greater than zero, that means you have dark energy, and energy is blowing up the space time. The space time will expand forever. And if you take um, uh, uh, this constant as smaller than zero, then you have contraction of the universe. And if you take solutions, if lambda is greater than zero, people speak about uh, the zeta space. The zeta, I think, was the Dutch physicist who, uh, who computed the solution uh, based on the cosmological constant. Uh, so if lambda is bigger than zero, then whole space time has a positive curvature, so something like a higher dimensional sphere. It is matched by the observation. And if you introduce something that is less than zero, then you get the anti zeta space, and the anti zeta space does not expand, it is a negative curvature, right? It does not match the observation, but it describes very nicely the structure of space time close to a black hole. For that not, you know, this is why people study anti zeta solutions in order to understand what the black hole basically does. Now we come to black holes. I already said that a little times, I need to change the presentation. We need to discuss what is escape velocity. So what is the speed of a rocket that wants to leave Earth and go to Mars or to the Moon? Right? It's the velocity Vf, F wie Fluchtgeschwindigkeit, I forgot to change it in English. Right? Uh, it's the escape velocity. Uh, you have a mass m, you are at the distance r, and you want to escape a mass capital M. How fast should you go? And the solution is your kinetic energy that you get based on the, on the escape velocity must match the gravitational potential. And if you resolve the equation, you get this formula of the escape velocity. And for planet Earth, 
This is 11, kil 11 kilometers per second, so you must accelerate your rocket to 11 kilometers per second, and then it can leave the gravitational field of, of Earth. For the Sun, it's much more, about 600 kilometers, and so on. So now I take again the um, Schwarzschild radius that we studied, that we think the formula came up in the Schwarzschild solution of the Einstein field equation. Right? If you, if, you, if, you take, if you start at RS and want to find out what is the speed that you need in order to escape uh, this momentum m, then escape velocity becomes the speed of light. Right? So if you, are, if you have a mass and you start at the, at the Schwarzschild radius of this given mass, any mass, uh, uh, any mass, even Earth has a Schwarzschild radius that is in the order of micrometers. Right? That means deep in the inside you have something, and if you are in, 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 uh, uh, very deep in the Earth, then you must have the speed of light in order to escape the center of the Earth. It's not a real experiment, but so if, uh, when you start at this distance, Rs, you must have the speed of light in order to escape, and if you are closer than Rs, the light cannot escape at all. And that basically means the mass appears completely dark because nothing can escape that, that, that is inside of the Schwarzschild radius. This coined the term black hole. Right? It's a black hole. It's, <coughs> it's a hole because it sucks everything in. You can't escape it from it. Um, and that means when you are within the Schwarzschild radius, closer than the Schwarzschild radius, no information at all can reach us. That means the area is for an external observer eventless, eventless, and this gives the name event horizon. So the sphere that is determined by the Schwarzschild radius is called the event horizon. Just didn't get it. If the escape um, uh, velocity is, is the speed of light, why can't light escape? Yeah, because the gravitational force keeps the photons in there. It can't escape anymore. You can't get faster. Yeah, but if you are closer, then it gets even more than C. Ah, ah absolutely. Ah, at R S and C, and if you are within the sphere, then okay. you must be faster than that. Uh, okay, absolutely. All right. So event horizon is the term because if you happen to be closer to the Schwarzschild radius to the mass, then well, you can't observe what's going on there. But isn't light massless? Huh? Light has mass. Yeah. And this is only for masses, right? So but if there is any other entity without mass. No, even the light is mass. E equals m squared. Okay. Yeah. And a full light. Absolutely. H times nu equals m c squared. Then you can compute for each photon of frequency nu mm -hmm. what its mass is. Okay, that's okay. Very simple. That's it. Yes. So here's now a <coughs> representation of a black hole, of a Schwarzschild black hole. Here's the Schwarzschild radius, right? Here, so to speak, is the, is the singularity. And what you see outside this here, the Earth negative curvature, right? And here the space is flat because we assume that outside the planet of a black hole there is no, there's no mass, right? And you can take pictures from black holes, right? This is a picture of a black hole. Uh, taken in 2019, right, it's a massive black hole in a, in a foreign galaxy in Messier, it's some 50 million light years away from Earth. Here is the black hole that is in the center of our galaxy. Right? Uh, and of course, we got the Nobel Prize for detecting that there are also black holes in the center and they did measurements here. And this looks a bit crazy. So, if here is the black hole, any mass that comes to a certain distance close to the black hole is sucked into the black hole. And what you observe then is called an equation disk up to its own stride. Right? So it gets faster and faster, faster, it spirals, and at the end it basically uh, crosses the event horizon that it is ever lost. Yes, um, I really like the pictures. Can you explain a little bit more how these pictures are taken? Yeah, they don't be coming out. This is, uh, it, it is only an illustration. Yes. The others are pictures. The pictures are taken with, uh, uh, of Deutsch, there's a 
Ach, du hast keine, sag ich, diese großen Radioteleskope, die über die Erde verteilt sind. Ja, also, du hast, you take different radio telescopes that are scattered around the globe, and then the individual radio telescopes are considered to be part of an Earth-wide radio telescope. And the colors, the colors, the black and yellow are really fancy. No, this is energy. You measure the energy of the photons and then you color them. Yes, then you color them as you wish. Yeah, you can do it in a blue and green. They are colored. Yeah? They are colored depending on the scale, right? Absolutely. The scale is colored according to the scale. Absolutely. So it's not visible according to the scale. Which one? The other color is it. Absolutely, absolutely. You shift it. You shift it. All right. I have a long father. Right. So you could make the black hole also white. You will see black holes. Yes. Okay. So, and then you saw this kind of kind of figures. What happens here is this is the equation disk. This is the equation disk. And because of the gravitational power of the black hole, the equation disk behind the black hole, the upper part, gets curved and it appears at the top. Oh, it appears at the, at the top. And the lower part of the equation disk is uh, curved to the south. <coughs> it appears here. This is how this kind of figures are basically taken. Right? Um, what we have here is how do black holes come into life? Uh, two minutes, how, how, what is the life cycle? of a star, so not soft engineering life cycle, mm -hmm. this life cycle of a star. Uh, everything starts with gas in uh, space, and then by chance, gas atoms are getting closer. They then found a very smooth, soft set of gravity, but over that time, more and more gas particles get sucked into, into the center of gravity, and then at some point in time, it gets so dense and so close together that temperature is basically <laughs> rising, and then a uh, nuclear reactor is, uh, is taking place. And then the sun, the sun is basically born. And the sun, you, know, you have heard that, right, is burning, it's, it's uh, <coughs> hydroxine, it creates helium, helium then is burned into uh, uh, oxygen and so on. At some point <laughs> in time... about the, the time scale? Is this a million? Of a mil uh, uh, million? A million. Million. of years. For, for a regular. So at some point in time it does then explode and a very nice planetary nebula, many people have heard about the crap nebula, very nice figures, remains. And at the center, at the center is a white dwarf. Why so fair? It remains and then it hangs around for millions, millions of millions of years and so on. If you have a mass that contracts that is bigger than eight to ten times the mass of our sun, you have a you have a much bigger star at the very beginning, and this only lives for a couple of million of years. Right? In, within a million of years, it becomes a so-called red supergiant, and the said red supergiant does explode and becomes a supernova. We all see that, a supernova. And the supernova, again, depending on the mass, the rest of the supernova is a neutron star. It's a collection of neutrons, extremely uh, finger, finger heads, finger cap. Of a, of a neutron star is, is uh, weighs much more than our sun. Right? So it's extremely dense. Or it turns into a black hole. If it's even a big, it turns into a black hole. Right? So this is the whole life cycle. Right? And yet this gas from a supernova or from a planetary nebula, it then forms another star. And this is how all the heavier elements got into existence. Right? All began with hydroxine. And then they cook the higher elements, that means, uh, very prosaic, we are stars. Right? All of the <laughs> atoms that we are made of have been created uh, by this kind of mechanisms. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So, these black holes, do they have any properties? Uh, the first <coughs> theorem that uh, uh, Penrose, Penrose also got a Nobel Prize, uh, they, they prove that singularities are consequences of gravitational collapse. So you can't avoid that mass is contracted to a single point or this circle. You can't avoid this. And then the question is, does any singularity always result in an event horizon? 
<coughs> because it would be nice to have a singularity that I can observe without having this event horizon surrounding it. And the hypothesis is that uh, the co uh, so the question is, are there naked singularities? And because God doesn't allow that, then is you have the conjecture of the cosmic censorship, right? Naked black holes do not exist. It is not proven. But most astrophysicists believe, okay, singularities exist, you can prove it. But the conjecture is they are always surrounded by this event horizon, black hole. They appear black from the outside. <coughs> then you can compute the surface parity. That, uh, M times G is not the Riemann tensor, it's the constant of air, so uh, M times G, blah, you can reformulate it. And at the, at the event horizon, when you have the Schwarzschild radius, you can then compute the gravitational acceleration. This is the formula. And people were considering, is a black hole completely flat, or are there mountains, and so on. And what this formula basically shows, no black hole is completely flat, no mountains, nothing. Right? This is here, the surface gravity is constant. Right? This was another um, uh, property. Another property that people thought about, what you can observe, really, observe is that two black holes can merge. Right, you can observe this by gravitational waves. This uh, figure that is taken by gravitational waves. It asks how to, how to take the pictures. Uh, also, Nobel Prize, gravitational waves. Um, if you have two black holes and one and, and two and they merge, what happens to the event horizon? And what you can then compute is the Schwarzschild values of the merged letter M is 2G and 1 plus N2. You can compute that. You have the two uh, Schwarzschild radius of 1 and 2. And then you take the area, the area of a sphere is 4 pi times r square, right? r, s is now the sum of Schwarzschild radii of the original black holes. And when you compute that binomial formula, here's another term. These are the areas of the black holes, of the individual black holes, but here comes uh, another sum. That basically means the area of the combined black hole is always bigger than the areas that the former black holes so again, the question, how long does it take for two black holes to merge? It depends so how heavy they are, uh, millions of years, and how close they are. Millions. So it means this is a very important theorem, the horizon theorem, the horizon area of a black hole can never shrink. And, and was there some observations of merging black holes? Yes. Again? Did they already observe <coughs> merging black holes? And you can't because it takes millions of years. No, yes, but did yeah, here. Yeah. This is a gravitational wave that you can't see. So here are two black holes. Yeah. They are rotating amongst yeah. the gravitational wave. Eventually, they will. Uh, eventually, yeah. You can't, because it takes a little bit. Yeah, you can't. So it would be fantastic. You see the event yet. It, absolutely. Yeah. It would be fantastic to see that. Yeah. You only have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there like a whole host of Like, can you empirically? What is better than a mathematical proof? And theoretically, you can, it takes millions of years. How can you imagine? Yeah, the, some of those things you can just put in the lab. We won't build it. Okay, at the end of the lecture, we will see that quantum computers can be used in a couple of months to perform gravitational experiments. Yes, I'm waiting for it. Huh? Uh, okay, uh, this is also an experiment. Right? Yes, it's an expert, yes. And you don't need to wait the whole time. Absolutely. So they build an environment where you can test that. You will see that Google sure. on, on their machine, they created um, a warm hole. Right? That they proved properties that theoreticians yes. have that. Okay. Right. I think we know from software engineering that there may exist sometimes some merge conflicts. <laughs> so, it's time for a break. <laughs> so, at the end of two black holes, uh, is there all, already uh, also just one black hole, or it may be possible? Yes, uh, tons of black holes are around. It's, it's like entanglement. It's ubiquitous. Black holes are ubiquitous. 
but you can't see them. You can only, only observe their effects because light that comes from outer space uh, across the uh, uh, so a black hole is here, light comes here, you see the effect, it's called Einstein lenses. Right? You can you can use these black holes to see behind the black hole and they even use by will these Einstein lenses to study what is the coarse grain structure of space time. Yeah? Okay. They are everywhere. Okay. And that, can it be postulated that um, in some time all the black holes will merge? Uh, as the, yeah, if the universe is contracting, they are if the universe is contracting, right? they are merged. But as of now, the universe is expanding. It's still expanding. Faster than light and accelerating. Oh, yes. Okay. Faster than light. No, but, but what we will see after the break <laughs> is that the black holes do evaporate. At the end, they explode. Oof. So something yeah, is coming if, out. If you can shrink the matter in the black holes, you would actually turn the expansion of the universe and, and get the decrease in the universe. Yeah, but there is other effects like the dark energy, dark yeah. matter, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the corrected. Nobody understands what this is. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah. I'm fascinated that. Dark energy is just the physicist couldn't figure out what it is. It's a problem. The dark energy, yeah. if you can figure out that this, they call it dark energy. Absolutely. It holds the equation. 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 It holds the equation.